following interview was conducted with Brian Lamb uh, for the Purdue University Oral History Program Project. It took place on Monday, August the 28th at Stewart Center in the Hissy Conference Room. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the oral history librarian. Also joining us is his wife, Victoria, and Stanley Morris, the acting head of Special Collections, will also be joining us. Having read several biographical sources, I know you're a Lafayette native. Can you tell us a little bit about where you were born and siblings and early years um, until you entered high school? I think I may have mentioned that what we're trying to do is sort of round out in your experiences in, in, in Lafayette and I grew up um, in Lafayette. I was born on October 9, 1941, in St. Elizabeth Hospital. My uh, mother and father, uh, my father was a native of, of this town. My mother was born in Perigold, Arkansas. And my dad was in the, he started out being in the tavern business. He had a restaurant at one point with his father over here in West Lafayette on uh, State Street there. Uh, and I grew up going to St. Mary Cathedral for eight years in grade school, then to Lafayette Jefferson High School for four years, graduated from Lafayette Jefferson in 1959. My parents uh, had, by that time, had moved to a place in Lafayette called Benton Woods, my last year as a senior in, in uh, high school, and then I enrolled in, uh, in, in uh, September of 59 at Purdue University as a freshman, lived at home the first year, moved into a fraternity house Phi Gamma Delta my second year and lived there for the three years uh, until I graduated in uh, June of 1963 with a Bachelor of Arts in Speech. Okay. How did you have to decide on your specific, was there a minor or how did you have to decide on your major when you were here? When I went to uh, high school, I got involved in radio and I worked at the local radio station WASK for five years and did a television show on WLFI Channel 18 for a year. Uh, and when I came to Purdue, there was no broadcasting school, per se. And I <clears throat> did a lot of speaking in high school, uh, was on the radio team, and decided that that was the best major for my interests at the time, because I could also do some of the, uh, select, I mean, the elective courses in radio. Bio sketch, one of the ones that I read said that you and you just indicated you were at Purdue University. Uh, what did you have, what prompted your decision to come to Purdue? I don't remember. I wasn't a very good student in high school, and at that time we didn't have to take the SATs. You would the school had to admit you if you got a high school degree, and um, so I, this was a great institution anyway. And it, <clears throat> in those days, it was $125 a semester. You could stay at home. I could continue working at the radio station, and I had a, I did uh, record hops, uh, and, I had, and I was a drummer at that time, so I could all just keep doing it here in town. And of course, I had grown up on Purdue sports. My father was very interested in it, and it just seemed like a natural place to go. Yeah. And you, and so, did you live in the fraternity uh, house when you were here, or did you did you live on campus? The last three years. Okay. First year, I did not. In addition, let's see, I, I understand that uh, you had this American Bandstand. That was, was that modeled after uh, Dick Clark's show? It was. We called it Dance Day. Okay. And I only had it for a year at the local television station. But it gave me an opportunity to have an experience in all the different fields. I had to build the sets and sell the time and host the program and all that and get the dancers. And uh, it was, I would have to say, it was a... Uh, resounding uh, non-success, but it uh, it was tremendous. Uh, it, you know, it was tremendous education for me. It just lasted a year. How was what is a non-success? It just it means it was it, successful it, for you, but for it did it means that the ratings didn't go off the charts, and the advertisers weren't lining up at the door, and even on one Friday, the the uh, dancers didn't show up. So, but I learned a lot. So. Yeah, Plan B in place, right? Exactly. <laughs> okay. Uh, in addition to the bandstand, was there any other clubs or st student clubs or organizations when you were at Purdue that you participated in or joined in? I was a student uh, officer in my, I was the president of the senior class. And uh, most of my time on weekends 
uh, was taken up with the involvement with the radio, because I worked every weekend, eight hours on Saturday and Sunday. And the fraternity took a lot of time. And then uh, also one year won, and this is not an honor so much as it was an event, the ugliest man on campus uh, contest. And the way you won that is raising money for charity. Um, and I was, I was the candidate of the Kyle Mega sorority. I don't know why, and I don't remember the details on it, but I was the winner. Uh, tell us, uh, was smoking allowed in the classrooms and the buildings when you were on campus? What was the campus like, the buildings, when you were here? Do you recall that? This was always the cleanest place I had ever seen in my life, and it still is. Uh -huh. uh, as a university, you could eat off the floors in this place. I don't remember smoking. I uh, quit smoking myself when I was 20, and I don't, I'm don't. i sure I didn't smoke in the classroom, uh, <laughs> but I, and I just don't remember. I know there was a lot more smoking then than there is now. You were talking about the ugliest man on campus, and I was going to mention, ask you a couple things about some traditions, such as you recall, you know, for at homecoming or gala week, and some of them might have been senior courts and the bowlers and the canes with the football games. Do you recall at the senior courts? Absolutely. I had one of the most beautiful pair of senior courts I have ever seen anybody wear. I remember hiring some expert who was terrific with the, uh, the I think it was the Disney characters, but I'm not, I'm not sure, but we actually, I, I don't know, I hope I have them somewhere tucked away in a box, I haven't seen them for years, but uh, they were, it was a gorgeous pair of uh, senior cords. Yeah, I'm very much involved in that. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't a big joiner. I had been nominated or whatever they did, pledged to Gimlet back then, and I remember dropping out. I just didn't have a lot of time, and, uh, but I, you know, I participated in the fraternity and the sports through that more than anything else, but we were we were big senior cord wearers. We wore freshman cords; they were green. Didn't they have the Didn't they have the freshman beanies when you were here? Yeah, oh and yeah. You'd wear those. I think we did. Yeah, yeah. unfortunately. On the cords, let me ask you this: Did how? Because um, I've seen some of them, and you know, a couple of times they've tried to bring them back, but it's not been very successful. Did Did somebody actually do the design for you? Yes, I hired somebody. I don't remember where I found them. Yeah. Some people could do it themselves, and they just slapped on the paint or whatever sure. we did. Mine were professionally done, and the characters that he drew at the time were of carbon copies of, I, I, for some reason or other, I remember Woody Woodpecker, and I don't know Woody, where Woody came with me. Is he time, was he Warner Brothers? I think he was. Woody he wasn't Disney. Oh, Warner Brothers, yes, right, just like Porky Pig. Yeah, because and one of my heroes today is Tweety Bird, so I don't know whether I had Tweety Bird on my cords or not. I know, you were talking about, um, you said you were the class president. Did they, was that, uh, now they have student government, did they have student government then? Was there, is there, was there a difference between the class president and the student government? It wasn't very important, and it was more than anything else, um, just a popularity contest among the people that ran. We didn't really run on important platforms, didn't have a whole lot to say about what went on, uh -huh. and it certainly wasn't involved in a student senate. Uh, I don't remember, that other than the, Unfortunately, that's what we have on a national basis, too. I don't remember a lot of governing experience. I remember more just the campaign. Okay, okay. Yeah. And I noticed that you also gave the graduation speech for your class. I did. Um, how did that, was that because it was a class president? It was. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. which was a tremendous experience. I, I remember I worked very hard on that speech. I have given that speech again. Oh, then you still have a copy. I was going to ask you if you still I, refer to I it. I do, and I gave it again when I was invited to come here and speak to the graduation of the Ivy Tech class at, for, in the Purdue Hall of Music, and I actually gave the same speech from the same spot, to, uh, you know, in the uh, Hall of Music, and I read the same thing again because it's still relevant today. That, that's one of the follow-up, that's what I was going to ask you, because you did come in May of 93 and you spoke at, at Ivy Tech. And I read in, an excerpt from the paper that said many of you went to Ivy Tech because you wanted to, wanted to learn skills. Could you uh, sort of resonate with the people, and was that also part of the speech that you have given at your commencement? No. Uh, I, uh, the speech that I gave at commencement was very short, uh -huh. and uh, I remember quoting people I didn't had no knowledge about. Uh, I'm trying to remember what the, the uh, oh, well, I'll think of it in a minute. Uh, the fellow wrote On Liberty, uh, John Stuart Mill. Uh, and, and I didn't know John Stuart Mill's work. I just knew that On Liberty said the kind of things 
that I believed in, and that was you're an individual, and you have your you have to answer to yourself. And so don't expect people to do things for you when you get out there. It doesn't mean that people can't help you, but you're going to have to work and do your own thing. And that was kind of the message that I had, that uh, mm -hmm. we're all individuals and we can make a difference. Yeah, very good. Um, now, you know that the C-SPAN archives are located at Purdue. And how, do you know how, how was they selected as the archivist? said? I think they started September of 87 was the board hearing of the nomination of the Supreme Court. Uh, actually, they're no longer located at Purdue, oh. which is a long story. Uh, they're still in West Lafayette, totally independent of Purdue, and that has been that the case for the last... Archives started in 1987. I suspect we haven't been attached to the university for at least 10 years. Oh, is that right? Yeah. But they, um, is there not out of the research part? It is, but oh, that doesn't okay. have anything to do with Purdue. We, we, uh, we had an unfortunate uh, uh, relationship uh, breakdown with Purdue, and the dean of the liberal arts school did not want us to sell the tapes uh, in her building over uh, here. And that came out of the blue. We'd never heard that before, and that's after we'd been in business for about 10 years. And we just decided that was a good opportunity for us to, to uh, you know, go out on our own and do our own thing. We still have the Purdue professor, Robert Browning, who spends 90% of his time with us, and then he still teaches a class. Okay. But uh, there's no relationship uh, other than we're quite anxious for anybody at Purdue to come use it, but it sure. doesn't have any direct relationship. I was going to follow that up with, do, do some of the professors use that as archive sources? I mean, what, uh, what is the user base? Do they, some of the, do you know, if the faculty uh, encourage the students to use the facility, the sources out there? Not nearly as much as we had hoped. Um, it, it, it's a fabulous resource for somebody in political science, government, mm -hmm. civics, all those different courses in history. Uh, it doesn't, I mean, it it makes enough money every year to survive. And we sell more to the general public than we do to students or student use. Uh, it was always really kind of a personal disappointment to me that we didn't have a more active student use than we do. But, you know, it's hard to get people to change old habits. And we couldn't, in many cases, couldn't get professors interested in using the video, and therefore the students weren't aware of it. But there was use here at Purdue. They had a lot more access to it than anybody else did because it was right here on the right. uh, campus. But eventually what's going to happen is that institutions all over the country will have a, an Internet access, as they do now, to the archive, to the abstracts and all that, and also to the video. So it'll get a lot more use in the future. Okay. Um, what is the most requested tapes? Do you know which ones? Do you have any ones that are requested more, or does it vary? It varies. I just learned... I uh, just came from the archive, and I just learned that there's a. I used to do a program called Book Notes, which lasted until uh, December of 2004. Um, it was an. It was. I was in. Did it for 16 years, and for a long time, the most uh, requested tape from Book Notes was by a fellow named Father Richard John. Newhouse, who wrote a book called As I Lay Dying. It was a story of his life when he was on the operating table and he thought he was going to die. But I was told just last week uh, there's a professor by the name of uh, Thomas Barnett who teaches, um, I think, the Naval Postgraduate School or one of them, or the Naval War, Naval War College. But he also has a presentation he makes, and he's made it over a thousand times on, on the future of... Uh, our relationship to the world, communities, and our military requirements. And that just all of a sudden sold more uh, book notes, tapes, even though it was done a couple of years ago, than any of them. So that's the number one. But we, we do know what kind of things sell. What sells would surprise you. It's not, it's not the speech from the floor of the Senate. It's usually some... Hearing, uh, perhaps. Or... Not even a hearing. It's, it's usually some kind of an event, a political event, where, or it could be, it's usually a special interest group of some kind that has a political event, has a speaker, and the speaker is dynamic, and uh, it just takes off. It's, it's really interesting. Interesting, yeah, that's right. Um, in preparing for this interview, a couple of names resonated. One is Henry Rosenfeld, and the other is Johnny DeCamp. I guess you, Henry you knew when you were in high school. Is he still, is he still around? Not only is he still around, I just left him. He is an employee of the C-SPAN archive. He's uh will be 88 years old next uh, this October, um, and he's been there for four years. Uh, I knew Johnny DeCamp, but not well. He was 
here at Purdue, and it was the voice of Purdue sports. Great guy. Uh, liked him very much. And, but Henry Rosenthal gave me my first job in radio back in 1959, right when I got out of high school. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. Well, talk a little bit about Chauncey Village. You know, Chauncey's the original name of Lafayette, in, you know, Lafayette, Indiana. Tell us a little bit about what it was like when you were here as a student. Uh, say, I know there are some traditions that are still here. Harry's is still around, which is a tradition even then. I don't know that I've ever been in Harry's Chocolate Shop. My niece worked in the last 10 years for uh, the organization that owns Harry's Chocolate Shop did the Harry's Chocolate Shop website. So, you know, we, and my father, you know, for years it was the only place in West Lafayette you could get a drink. And my dad was in the beer business, wholesale beer uh, business, and he he had to sell, not had to, but he sold them beer. And uh, it was always, you know, very well known in our family that Harry's Chocolate Shop was the only place in West Lafayette you could get a drink. Of course, that's changed dramatically. Uh, Lafayette. You know, it was, I, the only thing I say about Lafayette is, is uh, what a, I'm just glad I grew up in it. I mean, it was a great community uh, to grow up in. People were incredibly friendly and helpful and interested in me uh, as a you know a young person. I used to I knew a lot of adults, and they would you know they would impart a lot of advice. Uh, I, I got to know a lot of adults, admired them, and and um, I have nothing, absolutely nothing, but fond memories of Lafayette, St. Mary's School. Uh, also, Jeff High School was a great school, and uh, I'm still in very much in touch with people I went to high school with. Mm-hmm. As well, do you, um, some of your college you, you, uh, people in class in your class, do you see them from time to time, or are there some that are near where you live? Or in oh yeah, I, two, two of my closest friends live in Indianapolis that I was at, uh, at Purdue with, and uh, no, I haven't. I have. I, I would say my my closest friends were high school today and college. They're not people that I've met since then, although I have several good friends around the Washington area, but uh, I still stay in touch probably from college with, oh, as many as, oh, seven to ten people, mm-hmm. and in high school, um, a good half dozen, although every time I come back here, I see people that I haven't seen in a long time. I come back for the reunions, and the good news is a lot of people I went to Jeff and Purdue with come by the office in Washington, and I get a chance to see them there. Yeah. Talk about some of your professors. Were there any that you recall and, uh, made sort of an impact on you, and also any of your teachers at, at Jeff High School? A lot. Uh, I've talked about my Labrador. teachers Tell us a little bit about forever. That. Probably my, you know, I had a couple of favorites at Purdue. One of them was Eric Clithero, who's taught religion, philosophy of religions, and he was a philosophy professor and a wonderful guy. Um, Jim Houston was a history professor, and I've still been in Eric Clitheroe died some years ago. Jim Houston, as far as I know, is still alive, but he's getting way up there in the 80s. Um, he was very important. He taught. I had a couple of classes from him and, and learned a lot of basic history from him. Uh, and I had the pleasure back in 1999 when we did the series on the American presidents of inviting Jim Houston to be our principal guest on William Henry Harrison out at Battleground where we did our live broadcast. And... Uh, he was important. Richard Crowder taught me music. Richard Crowder was a fabulous uh, music appreciation teacher, and I didn't know anything about classical music. And uh, I remember that class, you know, like it was yesterday. Um, at Jeff High School, um, my strongest connection was to a man named William Fraser. He was my broadcasting teacher there, and uh, he died about two years ago. Uh, I was there to the eulogy and, and to help bury him here in town. He was a wonderful guy. We were very close all through my life. Um, Jim Hawker was the speech teacher, another tremendous teacher at Jeff High School. Lots of people. Uh, Jack Hopkins, C.J. Hopkins, was the uh, journalism professor that taught me my first course in journalism and taught me the who, what, why, where, when, and how of journalism. His wife, Susie, they called her, she was she was a big conservative and he was a big liberal, so it was fun to be in both of their classes. She taught civics and um, taught me how to read U.S. News and World Report. I mean, you can go down the list of the Kinslers who taught math, uh, and I'm going to leave somebody out of great importance. And at Purdue, I'm trying to think back of uh, oh, a fellow who's still around here, uh, Zink, Bob Zink. He, he is a great guy, a terrific teacher. In 
mathematics. Right? Yes. Right. Uh, Bob Zink was wonderful, and uh, I saw him a couple years ago. Uh, but you know, and, and I had a bunch of teachers in speech. Uh, Mac, well, Professor Mac, was the head of the speech pathology department. Uh, he was. Uh, he wasn't a great teacher, but he was, uh, he was, in my opinion, I mean, but he was a, a, a great professor, I mean, in the sense that his research and all were very important. Of course, you had, I never knew Monroe, but they had the Monroe uh, speech book that we all use, and he was a professor here, and, and they had the Monroe motivated sequence that we learned. Uh, and you know, a speech to entertain, to inform, all those things uh, I learned here. Uh, very important basics. That take you through the life, and you can always refer to them and utilize them. Yes. Okay. Um, I've read a quote. I'm an information nut and a reader of the printed word, which is great. And was this kind of always a special interest? I love that quote. I think it's, and I sort of follow along in it because I, you know, I try to keep up with things too, like you do. <laughs> I wasn't that way in college. Um, I read, and I was aware, but I wasn't the kind of reader that I am now. Um, that came to me as I, after I left college, I went in the Navy for four years, and a lot of the things that I learned at both Jefferson High School and Purdue came back to help me. Certainly, uh, I had a wonderful classics education here at Purdue, which you wouldn't think, you know, when you think of Purdue, a lot of people outside here think of engineering or mm -hmm. agriculture, but the classics were as good as anybody anywhere had gotten. I, you know, I went through all those uh, when I was coming through here. So I had the basics. But I, I, I learned to read the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal uh, and the Washington Post, which I was not aware of before I left here. Uh, and it, it, it's they're very important in my life today because that's where a lot of the world decides what they're, what's important. Uh, and then I got into books when I was 45 years old. I read here, and I read those classics, but I, when I was 45, I really got into reading because I wanted to, not because somebody told me to read. So, you get yeah. more of an, an impact and, and you read it from a little different perspective. Much. Yes. Okay. Um, do you think that um, think computers are going to lessen reading habits? Well, they actually probably increase reading habits, okay. but they won't be on a screen. Um, yeah. But I think um, it's just like a lot of things. The, the, the interest is going to shift. The economic base will shift. Uh, but having something on the hard page will probably always be. Kind of like an automobile. You just don't, you know, they dreamed years ago you'd have mag magnetic levitation and everybody get little cars and they just, you know, whisk you off somewhere. Well, you're not going to do that. Uh, and it's the same thing with reading. You're not going to give up all these books. They may be on, they may be digitized and they may be available on computers, but it's not nearly as satisfying as reading. They're going to be, right, yeah. Uh, I would appreciate if you could share some of your reflections on, on C SPAN and over the past, I'm sure others have asked that, but just sort of looking at it as a, reflection a little bit? Well, I think C-SPAN very much comes out of, of having grown up here uh, in Lafayette and gone to these schools here because as good as they were, we were far away from the information center and you couldn't get, I mean, if you got, if you wanted the Wall Street Journal, it came a day late because it came in the mail. Uh, you couldn't get the New York Times at all. It never moved outside of New York City. Not that those two things are the most important uh, reasons to uh, create C-SPAN, but the, the, I always dreamed with C-SPAN that it would be something that people here could have and would be a great equalizer in the sense that you could have the same information here and the same opportunities to be involved in the process as you can or you could if you lived out east. Because always New York and Boston and, and Washington have been centers of information, much more so than the Midwest. Uh, but now, and I, I think about it every time I come back here, it, there's equal access. And as a matter of fact, you could stay right here in this town and have as much information available to you on your internet, on your cable television, uh, at your newsstands as you could in Washington, D.C. You can get everything you can get in Washington here. And that's all been changed in the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good point. Do you see some changes any in the future for C-SPAN or uh, any particular things that uh, you might want to add to add to it or is you comfortable with are you going to bring back book notes? No, but uh, I'd love to. But I, I have a friend who always always enjoyed that program. Yeah. Well, I, I, I enjoyed it certainly myself, but I had to. I just had, it was taking too much time. It took, I didn't do it at the office. I did it outside of the office. It was 20 hours a week. 
the future of C-SPAN and any, anybody in this business, is we're going to have to have choice for people. Um, and the thing that's going to shift is the economic base. And I never knew how important that was when I was in school, but it's everything, you know, knowing where your money's coming from. Um, we will add to C-SPAN the ability for you to be watching the screen and seeing an individual, and then you can punch a button on your computer and you'll have a bio on them. Or you'll be able to punch a button on your computer and get their voting record. Or you'll be able to punch a button on their computer and find out who gave them money. Because that's what's going on in Washington. It's gotten way out of hand where uh, it's no longer what it was when we were growing up. There's always been money in politics. But now there's this direct idea of lobbyists coming to members. They often used to work for the member. Getting money for a project that has nothing to do with their district because they have these things called earmarks. And we have to figure out a way to let the American people know what's going on there. Because then what happens is after you get your earmark, then you cough up X number of dollars for a campaign. And it's, it's, they're, they're case after case of this. So what's happening is money for money. Money for campaigns, money for earmarks, earmarks for corporations, corporations, money, all that. And that is, it's gotten to where it is overwhelmingly uh, impacting what happens and how laws are passed. Okay. Okay, um, you can kind of watch that a little bit for me. Um, let's see. Um, as the CEO of C-SPAN, could you share some of uh, your thoughts on management style, including your decision-making and analytical skills and things? Some of our researchers that are going to be using this could, could benefit by that. Kind of thing. I yeah, I think the, the most important uh, thing I can say about my own leadership style is that it really comes from commitment to the project more than anything else and learning from others. I've had 15 chairmen of my board over the years who I have looked to at, at every time to find something that they do that I don't know how to do and learn from it. I was not trained in business. Um, I ended up hiring somebody 18 years ago who currently is our chief financial officer. He does a terrific job, and I don't have to worry about it. But uh, it's very important that you hire people that do what you don't do well, and then you listen to them, and you learn how to take their advice and learn how to let them have the leeway, the authority to do their own thing. I manage, uh, it's a, almost a cliche, by walking around, um, and the trick is to not let anybody know that's what you're doing. You, I, 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 somebody along the way taught me never have somebody come to your office, have you behind a big desk, and having, having the authority then to laud over them. And people are much happier when you go to their cubicle. So that's been my number one, get up every day, go to the office, go to them, don't have them come to you. Uh, the other thing is that at some point you've got to take a young person and give them uh, running room. And you just you turn the job over to them. If they fall on their face, that's fine, but you've got to be ready for them to, the only way they're going to learn is do it themselves. And I don't know that the people that work in our company feel that way about me, but I certainly feel that way about them, that I've turned it over to them and stopped nitpicking them because it was in the beginning, I knew exactly what I wanted, but I had to pull back from that. So uh, I just have learned an enormous amount from others, and I think that's probably the number one thing that any good leader uh, must do is figure out how to follow uh, some of the, the, the people that work around you. Mm -hmm. okay. oh, see, I also read that you got started the grassroots. If there's things that are going to be changed, do you see any big resistance? Is there resistance to change? Do you find that at all? Or Tremendous resistance to change. Okay. Uh, people, Particularly uh, in today's times when things are sort of fast moving. Well, today there's so many. I mean, I, I like to reflect the fact that when I was born, there were half as many people in the country as there are now. There are 300 million people in the United States, and there were 150 million when I was born. Uh, that means places like Lafayette, Washington, D.C., or Los Angeles are phenomenally bigger than they used to be. Traffic is bigger. Life moves faster. Uh, the other thing I find is that people live in pods. There used to be a time, and it was primarily because of television, and I actually didn't like it, that everybody would go home at night and watch the same evening news, and they would watch the same Ed Sullivan show. Uh, and they only had one television in the house, so the family would force them to watch together. Now, some people think, oh, that was great and all that, but 
I want my freedom. I want my choice. I don't want to do what everybody else does. And today there is so much choice. You cannot mentally deal with how much choice there is. And if you don't like what's available, it's your fault. Because you can get it either on your iPod, you can buy it on a DVD, you can find it on a cable system, you can find it on a satellite system, you can find it on the internet. It's unbelievable how much information and fun and entertainment and serious news and books are available. I mean, there is a Barnes and Noble in Lafayette, there's a Borders in Lafayette. Uh, they have anywhere from 100 to 120,000 titles. That never existed when I was growing up. You just go down the list of things that exist today. You don't have time for it all. And it, it, what you really have to learn how to do is choose your time wisely because uh, there's just too much to do. And it's the time management thing. A lot people have difficulty with that, don't they? Sure, absolutely. Uh, and with this wide range of choices and trying to to, to balance that with all the other things that that you've got going on, it's very difficult. Well, this is an enormously competitive system, and you just get lost if you don't if you're not ready to compete. Right. And one of the reasons that you're going to succeed is when you compete is if you know something. If you wander into a situation and you don't have any idea where information is processed and how it's processed, you lose. Okay. Um, a couple of things uh, we'll move on. Are there any questions that I failed to ask that you'd like to share or with us? With me that you think be uh, something that might have crossed your mind that I haven't really thought? No, you do with the university? I, you know. Um, Are there any topics that you wanted to return to that, that maybe that I mentioned? Produce a very much different place today than it was when I came here. One reason, one very simple reason, is when I came here, it was seven men to one woman. And now it's 52% to 48%. And that, uh, and you've got a lot of women here at this school making, you know, getting engineering degrees and things like that. I knew one woman when I was here getting an engineering degree. Um, that changes the atmosphere. Uh, and, and it's very important change. And there are a lot more women professors in the classroom. Uh, all of that is, has, has had a far greater impact than you realize until you go back. I mean, I'm in a classroom all the time because I love, you know, talking to young folks and finding out what's on their mind. Um, I thought then and I still think there's too much emphasis on athletics. Uh, you know, everybody revolve all their lives here often revolve around what happens on Saturday at the football game or what happens on uh, we have to switch. Uh, let me. Uh, so I think it goes. Here you go. You hit that. Maybe not, but. Athletics you were talking about. Yeah, I, it, it's, it's uh, you know, it, it drives a lot of what happens at a school. And, um, you know, I, it's just, uh, I, you know, I suppose nobody gets hurt, but it's gotten to the point where you have skyboxes at the Purdue Ross Eight Stadium, people pay, spend a lot of money for it. It becomes a way to raise money for the university. I understand that, and it's very important. But um, learning is what this should be all about. I wish I could do it again. I wish I felt that way about learning when I was here. I, I really didn't use the time like I should have. And I know a lot of people think that a university is a place where you come in, it's a social environment that's important, the fraternity was important and all that. There was a lot more exclusivity at Purdue than I would have liked. Uh, we were here in the midst of all these foreign students, and I never knew it. I never, you know, I never went there. I never understood how to do that. And um, my life is so much more complete today because I live in an environment which has a great deal of diversity, tremendous amount of people from other worlds and different color skin and all that stuff. Uh, that was something I had to learn. And, and here at Purdue, you just didn't have much of it, although you had foreign students, they were off in their own little worlds. And I think that, that uh, those two things, as I look back on my time here, I would have liked you know, to have less of the sports and more of the diversity. But that may just be my age and my own personal interest, because I know when it comes to sports, with an enormous number of alumni, it's number one. It, were there many international students when you were here? Yes. Where there were? Plenty of international students. It was a place now where quite Indians, Chinese, um, you know, 
people, at that time, people from Hong Kong, Korea, places like that. There were a lot of engineers. From, from Asia, there were some that were quite A lot of there. Asians that came here. There were some Afri a lot of Africans. Yeah, no, this was a, this has always been heavy into the international students, but I didn't know when I was here. Mm -hmm. And it was partially my fault, but I still didn't know it. Okay. Okay. Uh, a couple things. Um, I know that through the years you've gotten many awards, like the Indiana Historical Living Legend, and have some of the, what has been your reaction? Sometimes are they, are they a surprise or, you know, uh, they're a compliment, which is really uh, well, the Indiana at, Broadcast Hall of Fame in November. At the, at the risk of sounding negative, um, uh, the awards have never been important to me, except I must tell you, probably the most important award that I've ever gotten was the honorary degree from Purdue. And that was the first of those kind of things that happened to me. When did you receive your honorary? My guess is it was 1985 or 86, possibly. The archive started in 87, and uh, my trip here, actually it was probably 86, because my trip here for that honorary degree was what led to the creation of the archive through Robert Browning and Dave Caputo, who used to be head of the, the uh, political science department. And, but the idea that your old university, and I, I graduated from here with a C average, would give you an honorary degree, and I stood up on that stage at the same time, by the way, that the daughter of one of my closest friends, who, two of my closest friends, one of them was Dave Price and Jane Price, and Jane Hubdy Price is her whole name, and her, her father was Fred Hubdy, who was the president of the school while I was here, and Jane and I were classmates together, and her daughter uh, walked across the stage. Uh, and she also interned for us um, in, in Washington, but she walked across the stage and I was able to go out and shake her hand and congratulate her. All of that was more important to me uh, than almost all these other awards. I mean, they all mean something because you're being recognized, but I can truthfully tell you that I never ever wanted awards, and sometimes, uh, you know, it... it people get carried away with their importance. I don't have any of them on my walls, to put it that way. But it's how did you find out you were going to get the honor? Did someone contact you, or how did that come about? Bob Ringel was the head of the Liberal Arts Department. It was not called that then, I don't remember. Oh, I guess it may have been the Liberal Arts Department. Was it? No, it wasn't a school. Uh, I think I got a letter from him. Uh -huh. okay. Yeah, I, and it, it was a big, huge surprise. I mean, it really was. I've, I've talked to, um, being in archives and special collections, sometimes people come back and they've shared, they said it just, it really, it really meant a lot. And oftentimes they voice that in their comments when they're talking, when they're being interviewed for it. So yeah, it, it's just, it's something that I never, ever expected to get, you know. Uh, uh, and it was the first, and it meant something. Very nice. um, any, any other topics that you, that you might want to return to or anything you'd like to uh, sum up or make some general comments? No, except that um, I have nothing but fond memories of this place, and I remember it as being open. Um, you know, the, the Victor Variety's experience in the Hall of Music um, is as classy as any entertainment venue in the world. And they I don't think have it, that anymore. They, I know, and it's ridiculous because it was a wonderful thing. And, and it's a beautiful music hall. It should be used constantly. You know, it is similar to the Radio City Music Hall. And uh, I had the experience a couple years ago of doing the honorary degree in front of Ivy Tech and then a, a couple weeks later being on the stage at Radio City Music Hall for the Pace University uh, graduation. And they are very similar, and the same engineers were involved. And Purdue always brags it's about six seats larger. But uh, it's an incredible institution that you never quite know that when you're here. And the good news is, the more I'm, the longer I'm away from it, the more I learn what tremendous things go on here. And this is Sammy Morris, also. Hi, Sammy. Sammy. How are you? Did you, want, did you have anything you, you wanted to uh, ask him, Sammy, before we close? Is there anything you wanted to do? Well, Henry Rosenthal um, ran a, a clothing store in Lafayette uh, down on uh, Main Street, and uh, his father had been in the clothing business, and 
He had gone off to World War II, came back, actually was wounded in World War II, and came back from there, from Europe, and uh, worked in his father's business, but always wanted to be in like the radio business. Uh, and he got together with a bunch of locals, people like Joe Bannon and Dick Pittenger and people like that, and bought WASK radio station. And uh, eventually, he had a falling out with them and, and ended up buying them all out. And it was after he had bought them all out and as was general manager and owner of the station that he had been a friend of my father's. And uh, I went to him and told him I wanted to go to work there. And so he hired me for a buck an hour as a kind of a gopher. And that was where, it, that's where I really learned broadcasting and where co combination with my high school teacher, Bill Fraser, that they let me do everything. And that's what's so hard for people to see, is so often people are reluctant to let you do things in the real world. And it was a commercial station, and I was on the air, and I had to, you know, learn how to be an announcer and do it right in a commercial world because there's money being made. And that is one of the most important things that I've ever done, and, and Henry made that happen. I think this, I want to thank Brian Lamb. I think this concludes the interview, and we really appreciate very much you taking the time to, to talk to us. It means a lot to us. Thank you okay. very okay. much. Okay, I got one. Catherine. Okay. And